Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Spark seminar. Uh, my name is Maciej Mazurowski. I'm a faculty at uh, Duke University. Uh, and Duke Spark is an initiative uh, with a goal of advancing um, science and implementation of uh, AI algorithms in uh, medical imaging. Uh, here's some information if you'd like to uh, learn more. Uh, whether you're a Duke or not, uh, feel free to get in touch uh, and uh, let us know if you'd like to uh, work with us. Uh, today we have a great presentation from uh, Dr. Bennett uh, Landman. Uh, he is the professor and chair at the EC department at uh, Vanderbilt uh, University. Uh, Bennett, please take it away. Great. Thank you, Mati. Just as a technical note, did we get it up right? Uh, it looks good. Fantastic. Always good to have Zoom doing what it should. It's a pleasure to be here as I organize my last window so that I can see everyone. Today we're using the Q&A feature. So if you'd like to ask questions, please type them in the Q&A chat. They'll pop open on Mati and my screens. And I'm happy to answer them at the beginning or the end or the middle or whatever we'd like for this discussion. So today, I'd like to talk about multi-site studies of aging with diffusion-weighted MRI, and in particular, look at challenging opportunities with harmonization, also where my lab is going. Um, to start off with the uh, sort of necessary things, I have no financial of interest or relationships disclosed with regards to the subject matter of this presentation, but I have an ownership stake in a consulting company, Silver Maple LLC, and have received industry funding um, through Vanderbilt from a, a couple of companies in the last couple of years. So let's start off with the science. What are we looking at? Well, we're trying to study brain connections. And from that, we'd like to understand how do we move from this microstructure, which are voxel-wise or point-wise measurements, up through connections of extending through white matter things that look like axons, but we call them bundles, looking at the collection of those bundles, which could be a tractogram as shown, and then looking at those tractograms and saying, ah, this is a particular track or bundle or piece of white matter that has a particular name and then characterizing those. Well, we've been studying white matter and aging for a while. The how and where things occur is incredibly important for understanding different disease processes, different functions of the brain and neuroscience in terms of learning, in terms of aging, why and when and how do these curves happen throughout our growth lifespan and um, sort of aging and sort of disease. Well, Gray matter has been a particular focus. We often call these things at a very high level the circuitry of the brain and the white matter, so connections between them. It turns out to be a, a lot more subtle and um, difficult to characterize than one would expect. So diffusion tensor imaging gives us an idea to go after these. Multi-compartmental modeling allows us to have models of greater types of connections of crossing fibers. But what is the shape of this white matter? How is it connected? How does these shapes and changes move over the lifespan and in different responses to disease? Sorry about that. We're looking to characterize these age-related changes in white matter, microstructure, shape, and connectivity as what we have been doing with gray matter. So when we make a map of these kind of areas, we see that there are association fibers, there are limbic projections or um, commercial projections, and each of these have a different structural phenotype. And when we look at these types of bundles or collections of white matter, we can start to say how large are the endpoints, how many different gyri do they connect to, how far do they move sort of in a Euclidean sense, which would be the span, how far do they move in a geometric sense, which would be a length and a diameter, how much of the brain are they occupying. For each of these geometric measures, we can also look at different microstructural measures being a fractional isotropy, FA, um, diffusivity type measures of mean, axonal, radial, all these different types of properties of how is the tissue changing. So these are great. There's a lot going on. We can start to make maps of what changes. Let's do this on a bunch of different pathways, 71 on 1,200 subjects on repeated measures. So we have over um, 2,400 different sessions on a 50-year lifespan combining studies from the Baltimore Longitudinal Study on Aging, the CAMCAN study, and a Vanderbilt um, ADRC study. 
So we have all of these sets of areas, all of these types of measures. Let's put it together into a really big study. And when we make these maps, we see color coordinated maps that show that there is a frontal to occipital type of gradient of the types of changes. There are um, some left right asymmetries if we project it down in the temporal lobe. We see um, some areas changing more quickly than others. And then we can make unwrap these sort of spatial maps into a regression effect. And here we're just showing the effect at age, controlling for data set and subject with random effect, et cetera. And we can see that there are patterns of what changes where. Fraxin isotropy tends to go down, the diffusivity tends to go up. And we see that there are global factor changes, everything changing at the same time, as well as sort of local regional um, factors that seem to be more impacted in terms of aging than um, other types of projections. Great. We're working carefully with Kurt, who's pictured up here, Kurt Schilling at Vanderbilt, to look at the superficial white matter, go from these large scale projections to go look down at what's happening just beneath the cortex and ask, are these sort of hyper-local connections also changing with age? So we can take these same large bags of subjects, pile in some more, do these large sort of studies and see that there are definite associations either mapped on the top row from where these project. So these are shown on colloquially the U fibers of superficial white matter, but also showing this on the surface, what areas are connected. And we can see the central um, sulcus here, the pre and post central gyrus highlighted as areas of focal change, um, also in the temporal lobe and occipital lobe. And we can start to ask, who are these changing for and why? Okay, I've just talked at you for a couple of minutes in terms of changes are happening. The changes are rich and they're subtle. They are spatially non-coherent. Like there are spatial patterns in what's happening. It's not just one big thing happening. So what are we doing with this technique? And why am I as an electrical engineer sitting in EC department looking at all of these brains? Well. Diffusion MRI is a quantitative technique. And our idea is to create something that is either called virtual in vivo histology, mapping the local environments as in this electron microscopy image, or virtual in vivo brain dissection, mapping the extended connections. And we do that by watching the natural thermal motions of water. And we can take the amount of time that elapses between one pulse and another pulse in MRI and sensitize our images to this type of change. Well, this sensitization, advanced slide please, um, is dependent upon what's happening. So let's take a map of downtown Nashville. I hope you have a chance to come and visit. We have the lovely Cumberland River running right um, on the north side of the city, Broadway, which is the big tourist area, and um, the National Public Library, which is a wonderful place to go and visit. Lots of actual physical books, those still exist. And if we drop people in say, play please, um, in the library, we might see people wander around, search for search the stacks. If you drop people in um, the river, you might see sort of random craziness. There's a, no borders or restrictions within that very large water body of water. If you drop people down in Tom Tom Broadway, there literally is sort of the random walk, the drunken walk kind of thing happening, and you're stuck along the streets and the crowds. So if we watch it aggregate, the people in the library, the people on Broadway, the people in the river, they're going to have very different aggregate patterns. And we can start to infer the types of structures that are they are experiencing based on their aggregate um, signal profiles or aggregate motion. And if we model that in terms of extracellular being things, water molecules that are not constrained by boundaries versus intracellular, and then different shapes of cellular environments wrapped in myelin sort of big white matter brain areas. So the sensitization process allows us to point in a particular direction and create volumes of brains, each sensitized to different ways. So the red one on the left is sensitized sort of um, in a diagonal left to right and the one in blue on the right is sort of in a right to left um, diagonal sort of opposite direction. And these patterns are different. And we see 
different sensitization in the sort of corpus callosum connecting the brain and the peripheral white matter. We can see which way these tissues are oriented based on the signal attenuation in the direction that we're looking. So if we look in a whole bunch of different directions, we can fit a type of model, for example, a tensor model, which is just an exponential matrix product kind of here, and figure out what types of processes are happening on a voxel-wise level. There are many different models we could fit. I just showed you a tensor model, the, the six degree of freedom matrix in there, but we could fit a um, constrained spherical deconvolution, which is a sort of parametric approach of lots of different little peanuts mapping up. We can fit cue ball imaging, which is moving towards Fourier decomposition, a diffusion orientation transform, which starts to model more complicated structures, persistent angular structure, which sort of really sharpens this up, spherical harmonic techniques that use multiple shells and multiple tissues, and looking at more advanced deconvolution approaches and different compartmental modeling, da, 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 da. and we can compare that the same voxel would look different with the same, even though the same signal is observed in that voxel, depending on what model you looked at it. And a lot of effort has been spent on choosing the right model. So that's what a lot of people do. Now, I'd like to sort of say, okay, let's not take this argument right now. Let's just choose any of these. You can choose your favorite. Let me unravel something I didn't show you on all of those really nice plots earlier. There's still a side effect. So these are all of the aging effects plotted raw without doing that compensation that we had that regress out the site or we use combat for the site. So, we get very different absolute anisotropies, diffusivities, volume measures, um, um, branch volume measures from those different studies taken at different scanners at different times of the year, at different people. Uh, this is bad. This, this is showing that the underlying measures themselves are not fundamentally quantitative measurements. And if we look at the user manual on the MRIs, they're imaging devices, not measurement devices. They're not quantitative guaranteed. They're meant for human interpretation. So how do we get there? How do we go from having an MRI as an imaging device um, and moving it to a sensing device? How do we use it quantitatively? Well, to do that, I've got a team of people. This is us this fall and finally coming back together, mostly after COVID, um, taking the image acquisition combining it with signal modeling, and then putting image analysis in the middle. So our team has people focusing on imaging physics and biology in terms of biomedical engineering, the signal modeling, which is more electrical computer engineering and electrical engineering, and image analysis going into computer vision, deep learning, computer science, and bringing all these expertises together to solve this problem. Now, this is great. This is an intellectual challenge. We really like the neuroscience, but why is this a critical problem right now. Well, we need to solve this very soon because we've got a huge problem with Alzheimer's disease and a huge interest in understanding what's happening. 6.2 million Americans 65 and older are living with Alzheimer's disease. One in nine people over 65 has Alzheimer's dementia. And the big thing up here is the number of trials and the number of successful ones is extraordinarily small. And we have one pharmacological agent approved with a lot of controversy. So how could we figure out what is going on? Is there one Alzheimer's disease? Are there multiple? What are the early risk factors? How could we go in earlier? Well, vascular burden, so the um, impact of, of blood vessels and ability to get blood where it is in the brain. And APOE status, which is APOE4, which is the primary genetic associated with Alzheimer's disease, are associated with both baseline and longitudinal white matter damage very early in the aging process. So these are all cognitively normal controls and looking at their lifespan. And we see significant regional effects with both APOE status and vascular burden. If we can map these earlier, could we predict future impairment? And the answer is yes. Mapping white matter microstructure is significantly associated with subsequent impairment five to 10 years earlier. And we see very significant model effects in regionally localized areas. Great. But as biomarkers within a study, we see them, how do we use these across sites? 
how do we go from our initial small, meaning a thousand-ish people, 500 people, 300 people studies to something that would allow us the scale and power to look at genomics and say, are there differences among people? Are there different epigenetic risk factors that interact with a phenotype, that interact with the environment, that lead into this pathway? And could certain agents be useful for some people and not others because of these very early types of predictions? Well, the good news is there's an explosion of Alzheimer's disease data out there. The NIH and many other institutes have been funding a tremendous number of these studies looking at genomics, molecular biomarkers, structural biomarkers, and cognition. And in the last couple of years, the NIH has pushed forward this Alzheimer's disease sequencing project, bringing together phenotype harmonization so you can use these same ideas across sites functional genomics, so you know sort of what's going on in the genes and making that available for ML, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, whatever you want to call it. Now, we don't think that we ourselves have all of the answers. We've got a lot of data in a lot of different areas. If we can get these into the hands of people with creative hypotheses, we can do a lot. So we're bringing these together at a U24 mechanism through NIGADS to take in these data, harmonize them, and then put them out to qualified investigators. Hopefully everyone in the country who's working on Alzheimer's will have these data and be able to show what's happening. We have a large team of multi-site led by Tim Holman and Michael Caracco um, from the University of Miami, and then a number of regional centers. And there I am in the upper right, they put me up there with a very young looking photo, I appreciate it. Um, and we are bringing these biomarkers together. So what do we do? Well, in phase one, we have four large studies, phase two, 15 more, phase three, phase two, 14 more, and bringing all these to 13, four, four, thir 14, 13, to have 31 data sets in the initial phases, 69,000 people. And what we are doing in our little site is getting the white matter integrity mapped in a way that is useful for everybody. So a tremendous number of data, data acquired over decades, some scanners no longer exist, some brand new hot off the presses scanners. How do we get this in something that can be learned against all of the other cognitive, fluid, structural, vascular, spectral, autopsy type of markers? Well, for that, we're coming together and doing quantitative diffusion MRI, like the sort of making a quantitative mesh grid out of this beautiful picture that is our traditional qualitative maps. Well, this is not new. <laughs> I like these slides because these are two slides that I showed when I interviewed for my assistant professor job at Vanderbilt back in 2009. Yep, we're still working on representation, statistical modeling, these types of approaches. Now, we've come a long way from focusing on those individual models. And the whole deep learning revolution has allowed us to say, what if we could do data-driven inference? What if we can let the data speak for itself, taking that image, putting it on something that's going to search the space, and then coming up with the marker that we like? And for these, everyone likes a spinning brain if it chooses to spin, but not on Zoom today. Now, in diffusion MRI, we have a challenge. Computer vision, two-dimensional image, some sort of neural network, a nice binary classifier. Here's what's going on in the raw data from a diffusion weighted after it's been nicely pre-processed and aligned. There's a lot of volumes here. They're all slightly different angles. And every time you take a different image, the position of the head relative to the bore of the scanner changes. So all of these sample points are different. Even worse is sometimes the scanner doesn't do exactly what you ask. So there's variability in the shell. Sometimes you actually want very different sensitization levels. So you get per person a different sensing pattern and per study a different sort of intended organization. So today I'd like to push forward on AI is really ready to take on these problems across the levels of domain analysis for data to MRI. I'd like to first start that we can do distortion correction, which is sort of the pre-processing step looking at that harmonized modeling, and then going to consistent connectomics. So let's start off with the distortion correction. Well, any of you who work in MRI probably know the faster you go, the less accurate it is. And in diffusion MRI, we are going as fast as we can. And so these distortions affect the geometry that we find. As we look at this different level of geometry, we 
would like to get back to something better. Back when I was a graduate student, we just said, don't look up in those arrows. It's bad data. The rest of it's fine. The last 10 years, we sort of recognized that those distortions are not really local. They're global. And as you do tractography, they propagate into quite substantial changes in that tractogram, that connectome, those bundles. So we need to do something. Well, our idea was, could we use deep learning to enable this type of distortion with limited data sets rather than acquiring a bunch of really powerful um, additional imaging, because we still want to go fast, could we synthesize that? Well, with Colin and Kurt, we had the idea that, okay, this distortion happens primarily sort of next to air pockets. We know that the appropriate way to do this is to acquire mirrored acquisitions, that if you have a compression, acquire one that leads to a distortion. These are called reverse gradient encoding or um, phase encoding directions. But we don't have this to run through the tool that is called pop-up. Our idea is, could we take that distorted image and a structural image that's just hanging around but a very different tissue contrast and synthesize an intermediate that's a undistorted T2-weighted um, T2 image? If we get an undistorted T2-weighted image, could we say that has infinite bandwidth, push it through, and run what we call Symbo Disco? So how would you get a synthetic image? Well. We have the idea from Pix2Pix translation. Can we take a map and synthesize a satellite? Can we take a daytime image, synthesize night image, a hand image, and uh, put in a bag image? We could put in a T2-1 image and ask for a T2. And throw in a ton of data, throw in a standard type of pipeline that we post on GitHub. And lo and behold, it works incredibly well. And it's really easy. It's lightweight. And we can apply it even if we don't have that extra acquisition. So great. It was a nice little project. I was playing with it during my sabbatical period. And we came back and we applied it to basically all the data sets out there. And it works really, really well. It's great. We've posted it in a number of official pipelines. And the code is open. The data sets are open. And new for this year, we've actually found that it works really well on fMRI. Um, now this is not T2 data, it's T2 star because they're gradient echo sequences. We can synthesize that undistorted gradient echo sequence and get signal recovery and geometric recovery across what's happening. So we're, we're really excited about the generalizability of the synthetic images, mainly because our idea is we synthesize them, use them as a scaffold and then throw them out so that any artifacts from the synthetic images would have to project through that registration space, that signal matching space. And that serves as a nice sieve to remove the, the extraneous data. So great, we, we have a diffusion way for processing. We have um, deep learning engaged. What about that modeling, all of those different models? Well, the number one thing that we came up with is there is a truth. We can do confocal histology and actually see the micron level arrangement of all of the myelin if you stain it properly. And if we have a 3D microscopy image at a submicron level, we can compute whatever we're trying to model, whether it be a fiber orientation distribution, a signal fraction, whatever it is. Great. And it was really nice. The people who were experts in this were one building away and um, had a nice coffee machine. So we worked with Yuri Gao, Adam Anderson, Kurt Schilling to take the ex vivo MRI, so a squirrel monkey, the block face photography, the light microscopy, link them all back and get them in the original space so that we have a true thing that we would like. We have all the different models that we could produce and let's make it. We can do external validation. We know what it is. Why don't we go ahead and learn it? Well, a little bit of a rub. Over five years and quite a bit of effort, we got 567 voxels from three um, monkeys. So we don't have a lot of true data. And we all know that deep learning and AI require typically just a ton. Well, Vish, who's now currently in NVIDIA, came up with this clever idea of there's stuff we have a lot of. And what we have a lot of is scan, rescan data, because it's really easy. If you're in the scanner, you just run a second scan. So we have the truth data from the squirrel monkeys in red. We've got millions and millions of points that are 
the same person, the same scanner, the same hour, five minutes apart. So that really should be exactly the same. Can we do what at the time we called null space learning, what has come to be called contrastive learning in um, the field to say, let's keep these things the same and add on this extra loss function over here. So we still have our truth at the end, but those pairs lead to um, this extra prediction that should be the same. And if we fold on that loss function, we go from um, something that is much more consistent than we would get with, so this is a deep learning, this is the CSD, I was gonna, in a live audience, I'd ask you which one you think is which, um, but very highly high consistency with what's happening with a parametric approach, just based on those 567 truth voxels, and then contrast the function to keep every, all the scans, rescans consistent. Now, once we have this framework for contrastive learning, we can put anything else in A and B. We can put two different in vivo scans on different scanners. We can put them on uh, different sites. We can put them at different field strengths. We can just go crazy with how we want to regularize this problem. And that has led us down this, it started as a wild goose chase, and now it's just a uh, very fruitful path to explore. So before I go show a bunch of these figures, what I'm going to primary show here is the angular correlation coefficient. If you just take two FODs, the orientations that are localized model, and plot them on a linear graph of where how is one correlated to the other and get a row. So this can go from negative one if they're exactly the opposite to each other up to one if they're exactly the same. And if we look at the model-based approach, constrained spherical deconvolution, it works quite well in primary white matter tracks in that big a thick piece of white matter, but on the boundaries where there's gray matter, less signal, it's not all that consistent. Our deep learning approaches that are either deep learning or contrastive deep learning are vastly more consistent and reproducible. And we see that we can do this across acquisition types in terms of B values, um, that if you have a multi-B shell imaging, how do you get all the different shells to lead to a consistent modeling framework? We can do this across cell designs. Um, now, to do this, if we have one cell versus two shells or those kind of things, we need to have a little bit of a patch architecture to make it make sense. We can do this across field strikes. And just hot off the presses, we can create not just truth estimators that are, let's go, let's make the squirrel monkey data correct, but we could take any of the existing parametric models and add extra properties to them that we would like. For example, when you take a constrained serial deconvolution, which is a parametric model, and you run it on different random samplings of the same data, it's not all that consistent. Well, we can substantively increase by over 10% the consistency of those types of findings by training the model with the CSD ground truth, as well as the intersite performance. So we're really excited about having these new data-driven approaches to discussing the models and creating models with characteristics that we would like, that are desirable, that are optimal, and not being limited just to the ones that we have a nice model of a perfect sphere and a perfect cylinder with gamma distributions, et cetera. So to conclude here, what about connectomics? How do we think about the overall scale? For here, we've been really focusing on what are the white matter definitions? What are these pieces of tissue? And this is from Kurt and uh, Franz Brawl-Rehalt, who's now uh, um, up at Sherbrooke. Um, so what we did is we took a lot of folks or friends around the world and said, does anyone want to label these data? Gave them six unlabeled data sets where we've done all the processing. So everyone has exactly the same streamlines. We said, using whatever techniques you like, find these pathways. So we gave them 14 pathways. And we said, if you don't know a pathway, don't give us back. So hopefully I can play a little movie here. And as we look at the cortical spinal tract, we can wonder, same raw data going in, same actual streamlines, 14, uh, 42 different groups. Okay, next slide, come on, do it please. 
we see a lot of protocol variability. There's qualitative differences across the board in the spatial extent of everything. If we then go to um, the superior longitudinal fasciculus, let's play the same movie here. There's a tremendous amount of variation. And this level of variation really leads to completely different types of structures. And how do we do quantitative analysis if on one continent it's called one thing and another part of the continent it's called another? So we found that there was no agreement on individual streamlines across all of the groups that label the cortical spinal tract. Got a very high agreement at 50%, but nothing at 75% on the streamline agreement. So what we did is we said, can we use deep learning to help communication, to define consensus protocols? So we took, again, a large number of data sets, segmented all the tracks and said, just from the T1, could we predict prior probabilities? Could we say where tracks would be and then use diffusion to help refine and have additional knowledge? So given all of those tracks, we produce six different sets of bundle definitions from track seg all the way to FQ, which are just common ways of parcelating the white matter. We put these through a tile-based network that could localize these tracks with limited GPU, RAM, and all of those other things. And we show that we could get very high agreement between the deep learning and each of the different bundle sets, much higher than either a multi-atlas segmentation or a single reference atlas. To give you a picture of where they look like, here we go. And we can see that we get multi-atlases uh, not terribly great. Sometimes single atlas works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and the learning-based systems work much better. And so now we have a learning-based system that allows us to capture where things are going and when. All of these tools are being put into um, the DiPi system so that they are in open source and ready to be used. We are working very hard to break each of these different sets into different sort of compartmentalized pieces, as well as putting together large singularity images that capture all of these tools and make it turnkey. So if a user just wants to say, give me everything, no problem. If you'd like to mix and match components and understand what different areas are helping, please do. And you can do a pip install DiPi and get what we're working on. If there are things that I've talked about that are not in DiPi or not available in a way that you'd like, please let me know because we are really actively trying to get these to be available and get other people's ideas on data-driven inference at all scales to be ready. Now, there are a lot of different parts of the brain. There are a lot of different ways of presenting them, and there are a lot of different nomenclatures from each of these. For each of these areas, we can think of at least four different levels from the acquisition and pre-processing to the local modeling, to the extended fiber tracking and brain analysis, and then into the interpretation of what is a bundle, what is a connectome, what is a connection. All of those things have different potential definitions. Within those, we've talked about today, looking at motion and distortion in diffusion-weighted acquisitions. How do we sort of compensate for the slight jiggling of the head, the distortions from the different gradients. Well, synthetic imaging works really well there, but there are a lot of other problems we could talk about. At the local level, we've talked about reconstruction. We could think about all the physics-based models. I have nothing particular against them. In fact, I'd like to harden them using data-driven inference. But we need to think about the variation in the number of the directions, the B value, the scanner, the SNR of that particular acquisition and see how all those interact. Data-driven approaches give us tools to have handles on those and imbue particular types of sensitivities and types of optimization that are important. Okay, so we have handles there. Now, the third thing I talked about was in terms of interpretation. What is quantification? How do you know what these things are? What is the bundle definition? What is an atlas choice? I'm particularly interested in what is the actual information content of diffusion edit MRI, right? We make these beautiful spider-like connections of the brains, which sort of have a, a face validity. It must be true if it looks like that, because it looks like a free saw image of a brain. But is it? 
how much is this is our sort of emotional priors, our anatomy textbook priors, layering on the types of expectations and showing that we could get 80% agreement of the fiber bundles just from the T1. That's just a, a lot of the overall information content is already available in the structural. So how do we separate out the marginal difference that diffusion is giving us versus the joint distribution of what happened in all of those other modalities? It's a huge open problem. Now, as I showed you in the beginning, um, oh, so, and we also have the spatial priors to talk about that. As we talked about in the beginning, there are a lot of open problems. At each of these levels, each of these types of things don't just say I've replaced it. The motion problems in DWMRI in that actual acquisition phase propagate through to the local modeling, to the fiber tracking, to the interpretation. So at each of those different areas, you could basically do a whole PhD thesis on how to optimize this and how to get the most amount of information. Now, I don't think we have time to do a PhD thesis individually in my lab and all of them. But what we are trying to do is take a broad team of people, look at all of these levels, and create data-driven techniques that help us understand how do we optimize the variability? How do we capture our variability? And how do we then report back out that variability for the community? How do we report that back out? If I'm going to give you all of these fiber tracks with the metrics on them as part of those... 70,000 odd people in the first phase of the ADSP. How do I give it to you in a way that you can use efficiently? And if you'd like to go back and alter the ways that we are doing it, great. We'd love to take those technologies and bring them back in. So I hope I've convinced you that we are doing exciting things at Vanderbilt as chair of the department. I have to give a plug. If you're an undergraduate um, looking for moving sort of the same latitude um, over a bit in longitude, come on over. Um, if you're a graduate student, we have postdoctoral opportunities and it's a lot of fun to be here. We've got a lot of interesting problems, both in my lab, as well as in our Vanderbilt Institute for Surgery and Engineering and Vanderbilt University Institute for Image Science that is highly related to the sort of engineering side and science side of the problems I've talked about. Also, if you'd like to stop for a shorter visit, we have middle 2023 coming on up um, in Nashville. It'll be a lovely time to talk about deep learning and AI. And uh, right on, it'll be hosted right on campus. Deadline is January 15th. With that, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors and you. And hopefully I've left the appropriate amount of time for questions. Uh, thank you. Um, so, um, for all the participants, if you have any questions, please uh, type them in the, the Q&A uh, section. Uh, so you should be able to see that on, on Zoom on the, on the bottom next to the, the, the chat. Um, uh, so please go ahead and uh, do that if you have any questions. Uh, so I'll start. Um, so looks like the looks like the harmonization is uh, is uh, and has been a, a very important issue um, in uh, brain imaging and both neuroimaging and and uh, structural imaging, right? Uh, and maybe particularly in the the neuroimaging part. So uh, whenever there's a question of uh, of harmonization and and different domains of the uh, of the data or th that the data comes from, uh, there is a potentially an opportunity for using uh, domain adaptation in, in, in deep learning itself, right? So just adapting the, uh, the models themselves. Is that the case here? Is there a space for that? There's definitely a space for that. Um, Jerry Prince and his group IACL up at Hopkins have done some wonderful sort of pre-network domain adaptation work we are pretty advanced in what can be done structurally in domain adaptation. So I didn't cover any of that. I just focused on the diffusion side. Thinking about how we integrate that type of information with the very diverse sensing bases and the, the sort of meaning of the diffusion data is what's been limiting the direct computer vision type of translation. Now, when we think about diffusion data, 
if you run an experiment at a particular B value or a, a level, a shallow degree of sensitization, that experiment is a combination of how much sensitization you did as well as how long you worked. The different levels of sensitization weight the different um, amounts of diffusivity differently. And the amount of time that you wait leads to different physics experiments, right? You're going to have more or less interaction with wall environments if you go a very short time versus a very long time, letting the sort of thermal processes either reach equilibrium or not. And so there is a physics reason why those experiments are fundamentally different and are sensitive to different types of tissue. How we unwind that problem and remap the sensitivity then becomes sort of a, a sensing problem. Is it just a reweighting or are there actually zeros in there where something dropped below the detectability? And then when does that matter? Or when does it not? That's a, a big problem when we go across different types of acquisitions that is really just being understood. Okay, uh, thank you. So, um, and, and you, you touched on this, but uh, but didn't uh, uh, go much into this, and maybe maybe it's because your lab is not focusing on it. But um, in case you know the answer to this question, how would you describe the the current state of the um, image harmonization for MRI in structural brain imaging? Is it? Would you consider that a, a solved problem or or not? And absolutely yeah. not solved. Um, we have a collection of methods which are becoming increasingly effective. So the domain adaptation um, networks work well when the the images are close type of sequence. So if you have a um, T1 image that's slight, T, these are T1 weighted images that are slightly more weighted T1 or slightly more weighted proton density or slightly more, those kind of things, the domain adaptation work very well. And our segmentation networks have become quite good at either adapting um, the pre-deep learning atlases to match the contrast to make sense, or in post-deep learning, either generalizing the network so that with data augmentation, it's not sensitive to those types of changes, or actually pre-changing the contrast. So that's those are all sort of hot off the presses in the last, with multi-atlas four years, with deep learning 18 months to six months to now type of things that are coming out. Now, when you take a step back and say, can you harmonize very broadly? There's a bunch of work on fingerprinting. of Oh, I just need this sequence or that sequence, and it will let me synthesize all of the others either through a physics-based modeling imaging equation or via a data-driven inference of patches and those kind of things. Those work incredibly well on the training sets and the validation sets that are carefully chosen to match. When you start to go multi-site, it's hard. And you get weird artifacts and the stability just isn't quite there yet. And so, that's probably related to the disease changes of interest either are in your modeling area or they're not. And how much sensitivity do you need to MS, to a stroke, to aging, to um, enlarged ventricles, to um, a developmental abnormality, uh, NF lesions, all these other things. And so pushing those boundaries is very hot in computer science. And it looks great pushing those boundaries in a way that we can use quantitatively in the applied sciences is got a little ways to go. It's getting there. Yeah. Yeah. It's in terms of the, the problem being solved or not, that was that was my impression too. And and frankly, I was somewhat surprised that even though the problem is so the problem of, of heterogeneity of data is so well um, acknowledged, it's uh yeah, that's the, the amount of work that is done on it is not really reflecting how important the problem is. Uh, and getting that work to be portable across sites in an open and transparent way 
has historically been very difficult. And so I'm a huge fan of the challenges that release a set of data sets and a metric that we can agree on that is imperfect, that then leads to discussion. So we've done this in a number of different ways, um, but getting those data sets that are basically CC zero or CC by of anybody can use them. You can use them for calibration. You can use them for harmonization. You can use them for labeling. Please use them. And then getting to a point where we can have a fair and consistent comparison is really important because making something that's beautiful has become easy. Um, making something that's useful, it's, it's really hard to prove usefulness. It's really hard to prove that second layer of, and this is ready for prime time, because so many of the things that we have done just blow up when put with a little bit of abnormality. Yeah, so so I'll actually I'll get to to that uh, the the useful versus beautiful question in a second, um, but I wanted to uh, encourage our participants again that if you have any questions, uh, please type them in the the Q and A. Uh, but so, uh, what do you think about the use of generative models in in harmonization, right? Because so so we are actually we are actually working on. <clears throat> On harmonization of uh, breast MRI data, which which poses you know some 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 of the same issues as as brain MRI, but also some additional issues uh, related to non rigidity, right? Uh, and what we find is that uh, generative models can be very powerful, right? But there is but there are risks of inaccuracy, right? So you're you're basically as you said, you can make things look nice, but are they are they uh, well truthful in, in in a way, right? So that's that sort of question. So, what do you think about generative models for that application? I'm excited for them as long as we have enough diverse training data to assess them. And um, it's interesting that you mentioned breast MRI. Our group was looking at breast CT basically because breasts are in chest CT, and how do we? look at body composition and integration of biomarkers from one of the most common radiological procedures for you know anybody who's a heavy smoker over 55 is go get an annual CT. So you have all of this imaging data being acquired on a very large chunk of our population. How do we get actionable data from it that's more than you have cancer or possible lesion, go get worked up versus please stop smoking, right? How do we get to a deeper characterization and usefulness of health data? And one of the things that we needed to do was actually calibrate out the, the ideas in the head of let's just register chest together and um, we'll move the breast together. It, it doesn't work. The um, deformable models meant for organ level things don't work at body level and definitely don't work on extremities. So making sure that we have contextual navigation, that we get glandular tissue, that we get muscle tissue, that we get fat tissue, that we get skin, all make sense along with devices and implants and those kind of things is really important. So getting data-driven context, whether it comes from a generative model or whether or not that context feeds into a data model is really important. Okay. Um, we have a question on the chat here from what platforms have the x model you world for annotation? So those were diffusion weighted annotation, and we let each platform use their own uh, type of approach. So many people had their home built custom solutions. Some people used um, DSI Studio. Some people used DiPi. Some people used um, what's were the others? MR Tricks. Every different platform used the solution that they were already using. We didn't ask anyone to use anything new or learn anything new. And then in terms of federated learning, I'm also a, a huge fan here. We've had a number of problem data sets where we say, let's get everyone together. We propose a grant. We get the institutional buy-in. We say we're going to bring these data sets together and do sort of a large-scale project. The funding hits, federal rules change, and the university lawyers say, yeah, it's nice we approved that, but the rules are different. We're not going to let you do it. And so protecting GDPR data in Europe, HIPAA data in the US, 
and making sure that we can do the science that the people consenting want us to do while still protecting sort of the fundamental rights is really important. And I think federated learning and federated auditing are where we need to go. We need the local repositories to be big enough that we can audit and make sure the AI is doing something reasonable. And then we need structured OMAP kind of um, annotations of the data linked to good quality clinical data in consortiums that have reasonable intellectual property um, type of trades so that if one university isn't seen as mining or stealing or whatever, anything else, that it's a collaborative open science kind of area. So those are issues that I think are coming up. I think the lawyers are recognizing that we need to deal with them and that the privacy folks and the risk mitigation folks are like, this is what we should do. Just move the algorithm around. That's just a bit of code. Don't move any people's sensitive protective data around. So getting that audited is, I think, very important. We have a couple of papers, um, one with the Manai Consortium that was in Nature Methods and one that was published just yesterday, I believe, in Nature Communications led by UPenn on showing these methods work very well. I can't hear you much. Yeah, another question that I've been thinking about is uh, on the uh, evaluation of the methods, right? Because there are some some obvious ways uh, of of uh, thinking about evaluation when you have paired data, but sometimes you might not. So, what uh, what are your thoughts on on uh, uh, on the actual actual evaluation of the harmonization methods? The metric we use is incredibly important. And through Mackay in our special interest group on challenges, we have been having a series of discussions and critiques and analyses of the different types of metrics and the role of metric in understanding what outcome is. Because we can have exactly the same experiment, exactly the same data, and a slightly different metric would lead us to opposite conclusions. And so I think we need to do a lot better in educating ourselves about the importance of the metrics. I tell my students early and often, it's incredibly easy to lie with statistics and that every time you have a statistic, you need a qualitative measure. I think we need a corollary on that is it's incredibly easy to lie with metrics. We can make a metric show that we, we want that then leads into a statistic that we want. But if the metric isn't doing what we emotionally say that it's doing, or it's not the right thing to look at harmonization or anything else, then we need to be real with that and adjust our expectations and adjust how we communicate that. Yeah, uh, I think that uh, that uh, one solution here would be to really to really focus or to really be goal oriented, right? So so why are we harmonizing data? It's it's to you know, for a certain reason, right? Depending on the on the specific application, uh, it, it might be different things, but it's often some sort of diagnosis or, or prognosis, right? Or measurement that uh, that we want to do. And so I think that that, that uh, both is difficult because you have to have uh, some of that ground truth or data to, in order to construct your metrics, but it also is an opportunity for evaluation if you don't actually have a more kind of intermediate pixel level data that you could use for the evaluation, right, in, in, in the pair data. That's, that's kind of my take, the current take on the, on the, the evaluation metrics. Absolutely, and a lot of times on the multi-site harmonization, the, pro the proportion of the known risk factors or known demographic shifts. So we might have 500 people in one study, 1,000 in another. And the way that the inclusion criteria are structured, one study may be enriched for um, a particular group that's not well studied or maybe in risk for people at risk or, or, or. And so if you just say, well, the control should be the same, 
that's, that's a sort of nasty hypothesis to layer on. And so the statistical techniques of combat and all the different sort of statistical harmonization um, approaches do a very good job if your stated assumptions are correct. But if there's some other factor that you don't know about, then you've just blown it away. And making sure that we go as far as we can with the data analysis and make sure that we use estimators throughout that are as have as least sensitivity as possible, that have the highest consistency, that self-assess variants, so that instead of saying, if I have a spreadsheet, they're all IID, that um, we can know that some mo some are higher variants because there's more motion or lower SNR or, or, or we can do basic core statistics given our known statistical properties of those markers. And we should be using that type of information in our AI ML. We're not yet because it's not available. It's not easy. That's maybe our measurements our estimates of variability are loose estimates in of themselves. So how do we fold all of those together so that our full picture of variability and consistency is important and correct so that we're not lying with statistics, we're not lying with metrics, that we are moving forward in a way that makes sense. All right, well, uh, I think we can conclude on that note. We're coming up on time. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation and uh, discussion, and uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you. It's been a pleasure being here. Bye.